It looks like most people have gotten connected. So I think let me introduce our speaker this evening. Firstly, I'll say welcome to everyone. Thank you for attending. This is the Stony Brook Southampton School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences uh, Spring Lecture Series. Uh, we're the first Thursday of each month. And so I'll forecast that on April Fools, uh, <laughs> we'll be speaking. I'll be giving my State of the Bays presentation. So stay tuned for that. Um, and I think we're going to have a presentation from the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program on the first Thursday of May. Um, but tonight, uh, we are quite fortunate, as you just heard in the conversation, uh, one of the good things of Zoom, we can bring people from anywhere across the country. So tonight, we have uh, a researcher from, well, all the way from the middle of the country, but who's been all around this world, um, Kyle Newton, um, who's a sensory biologist and interested in animal behavior and neuroscience and marine biology and does a lot of work with sharks and rays and fish. And, um, Kyle got his uh, master's degree from Cal State Fullerton and did his PhD in integrated biology at Florida Atlantic University. Uh, and he's currently a postdoctoral researcher at Washington University uh, in St. Louis, uh, actually in a med school there. And so he, he, can, he can tell us how we did that, we were talking about just before uh, we let everyone in, but uh, we're real fortunate to have Kyle here tonight and I'm personally very excited to uh, see this presentation. So without further ado, Kyle, uh, please go ahead and take it away. Thank you, that was, uh, I'm honored to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity and thanks for the great introduction, Chris. Um, again, my name is Kyle and yeah, I'm a marine biologist in the middle of nowhere. Um, I, uh, I took a postdoc there a couple of years ago, and it's actually kind of broadened my, my uh, sort of interests and skill set. Um, <clears throat> but tonight I'm going to talk to you about cryptic senses in fishes. And so what do I mean by cryptic senses? Well, you think of the common five senses that we have as humans. Well, there's a whole bunch of sensory modalities out there that other animals have that we don't have. And I like to call them cryptic because we don't have that natural sort of appreciation for them. So I'm going to talk to you about some of those tonight and then how <clears throat> in my research I'm using these sort of sensory modalities uh, from wildlife and model species uh, and also this new thing I've started to learn uh, in my postdoc with machine learning techniques to actually address some of those ecological questions. So I'm taking all the kind of the money and and sort of techniques and cool stuff that you can get at a med school and actually starting to apply it to actually more personally interesting questions outside of the med school and outside of the lab. <clears throat> so with that, I'll get started. So, so what is it? Oops, let's make sure that I'm actually, there we go. Um, so what is it that we're talking about? And it's this idea of sensory ecology. And so what does that actually mean? Well, as a sensory ecologist, oops, okay. looks like I'm a little laggy here. Okay. <clears throat> I'm interested in how animals acquire environmental information. So what do they learn about their environment? And then once they acquire that through a sensory modality, how do they actually process that in their brain? And then how do they respond to it behaviorally? And these cues that we call them, they can come from a variety of sources. So they can come from animals and other sort of like conspecifics, predator, prey. So those are what we call biotic. And then we have sort of the more physical environment. Those are abiotic. So that could be things like sensory or light levels <clears throat> or anthropogenic sources of, uh, you know, say like something from here, we have this picture of a seal, but he's in, a, um, in, a, in a, uh, an oil rig there. So there's a lot of things coming from there. But as a, um, let's see, oops, sensory biologist, I'm really interested in the physiological function of the sensory uh, system in question. And then of course, what changes, or, or when you make changes to the physiological function, how does that change the behavior downstream? And this has broad implications for um, what's becoming an issue now are anthropogenic impacts to, uh, or, or things that humans do to impact these sort of sensory capabilities and the behavioral responses of animals. So the first thing I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give a little background on probably the most classic, or at least what I think is the most classic uh, cryptic sense, and that is <clears throat> electroreception. And it's most commonly known about in sharks and rays. 
And typically you will see something like this and you'll see somebody will point to, so I'm gonna bust a little bit of a myth here. There are these pores right here, these little black dots and people go, those are the ampullae of Lorenzini. Those are the electroreceptors. And I'm here to say that is completely not true. Well, it's mostly not true, let's put it that way. These are related to the electroreceptors, but they're really pores that lead to the electroreceptors. The electroreceptors themselves are actually underneath the skin right here. So here we're looking at the skin, they're subdermal located several centimeters away. And right here, you would have a pore and it's connected by this canal to the receptor cells <clears throat> located again, several centimeters away. So it looks a little bit something like this if you have a cartoon. So on the left, we have a picture of what it looks like in real life. And this might be a shark where here's the brain, olfactory bulbs. And then here are the little yellow dots. Those are some of the pores from the electroreceptors. The canal is the green and the electroreceptors themselves are here in the ampulla here. <clears throat> and it looks just like this. Oops, hold on. I keep clicking on the wrong thing. So there's your pore your canal, <clears throat> the ampullae of Lorenzini, so that might be a familiar term, and then they're connected to the brain by the dorsal root of the anterior lateral line. So this is how I kind of remember it. Most of us have seen Harry Potter, right? <clears throat> and I'm assuming everybody's nodding their head because I can't see any of you. So think of it this way. The pore right here is kind of like platform nine and three quarters. That's how you get to, you know, Hogwarts. That's always that mythical place in King's Cross. And then you take that that train ride down you know, the tracks and then you get to Hogwarts. Hogwarts is where all the magic happens because we're all underage wizards and we can't perform magic in downtown London. So the magic of electroreception is occurring in Hogwarts, this kind of related or isolated sort of area. So when you see those pores, you can go, eh, that's actually not true, quite true. So <clears throat> just remember that. It's close enough. You, if, you, if you actually don't remember it, it's okay. I'll let you slide. Here, if we look at the brain itself, we'll see that <clears throat> that dorsal root of the anterior lateral line is inserting right here. And if we take a little cross section right here in the hindbrain, and we look at that cross section, we see that the ampullary of Lorenzini insert into the brain what's called the dorsal octavolateral nucleus. That's okay, you don't have to remember this. But what's interesting is the lateral line itself. So there's another sensory, cryptic sensory modality called the lateral line, and that's how fishes can detect water flow. That uh, nerve comes in right here at the medial octavolateral nucleus. And then below that, we have the eighth nerve, which is a cranial nerve that we have, and that's for auditory and vestibular inputs as well. So you'll see that they all kind of come in at the same area. And this is because they've all ancestrally derived from the same sort of sensory modality. And it's based around a sensory hair cell. That's how they detect the various stimulus. But those hair cells over the course of time have evolved to detect different stimuli like electric, bioelectric fields, mechanical displacement of water, uh, acoustic sounds like, you know, you can hear me now, <clears throat> and vestibular, you know, your inner ear that gives you a sense of your sort of spatial orientation. So that's part of the octavolateralis system. <clears throat> Looking a little more specifically at the ampulla itself, so here's a little cartoon, and uh, let's see. This is the pore, there's the canal, and these are the primary afferents. So that's the connection, the very first connection from those sensory cells that goes towards the central nervous system. And this canal is filled with a glycoprotein gel, and what that does is it's actually electrically conducted, just like seawater. So <clears throat> what winds up happening is any charge that it accumulates here at the pore can be detected down here at these sensory cells. And the reason or how that works is that charge will uh, either attract or repel protons within this gel and then results in a net charge here in the ampulla. That gets picked up by these sensory cells here located, there's the electroreceptors an SC actually doesn't mean sensory cell, it actually means supporting cell. So the supporting cells are there to kind of make sure that the electroreceptors are well fed, so to speak. And if one of them dies, they start to turn over and go through uh, cell division and things like that. <clears throat> Looking at the receptor cells themselves, I'm going to give you a, a little bit of an idea of how they work. That's actually pretty cool. Um, all these sensory hair cells, electroreceptors included, are what are called tonic receptors. So that means that they are constantly firing. That means they're releasing neurotransmitter 
and there's a constant signal here, like this sort of all these lines here represent this do, 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 do. And what that does is it makes them incredibly sensitive to weak stimuli. So that's what makes these electroreceptors so great at detecting bioelectric fields. So in the case of ampular electroreceptors in a laser break, so that's a shark skating array for those of you who might not know, you can have a positive stimulus here. And what that does is it actually inhibits the firing rate, slows it down. <clears throat> Whereas a negative stimulus will increase the firing rate or excite the cell. And what it looks like sort of schematically here, so here at the apical end, that's the, the part of the lumen. This is the internal part of that ampulla. The basal end is that's where it's connected to the afferent. You get this accum accumulation of charge here. <clears throat> so in this case, we have a, a negative charge. And what winds up happening is you get the opening of these voltage gated calcium channels here at the apical end. That allows calcium to flow in. The more charge, the more calcium flows in such that what winds up happening is the, the membrane itself is actually excitable and it winds up getting this wave of depolarization that travels from the apical end all the way to the basal end. What winds up happening here when it gets to the basal end, there's another set of calcium channels. <clears throat> when those open, again, calcium in, flows in, but the interesting difference here is it starts to, it binds to this uh, complex here on the, the synaptic ribbon that's what this is. And there's these little vesicles of neurotransmitter here, these little green circles. Those vesicles get released into the synapse. They bind, or at least they, their contents get bound <clears throat> on the, the primary afferent. And then you get the chemical signal going to the central nervous system. So that's how actually an electrical stimulus can get transduced into a chemical signal that the brain can then interpret. One of the interesting distinctions about electroreceptors, at least ampullary ones in laser mix, they do not have an efferent uh, connection. So that means there's no feedback from the central nervous system to actually modulate the activity or the sensitivity of this particular uh, sensory cell. <clears throat> so let's go. What are the primary functions of electroreception? And most of us are probably familiar that it's actually predation. That's so here we have a great hammerhead and it looks like she, I think it's a she, yeah, it looks like a she because there's no claspers that I can see. She's cruising uh, close to the surface of the, of the, uh, or the substrate here looking for a bioelectric signature. And in this case over here, they're chasing this poor stingray and I don't think the stingray made it, but we won't show you the gory details, but this is primarily what animals use electroreception for is the detection of prey. And <clears throat> so here, if we have an example, this is from an experiment that my old PI used to do. Um, and so you can actually set up these electric dipoles that mimic a bioelectric field. And what winds up happening is that they can detect this from, it's a pretty short range modality. We're talking 30 to 40 centimeters. So that's like, a you know, not very much. It's about like that far, but it's very sensitive, very sensitive. So we're looking at like a nanovolt per centimeter which is incredibly weak voltage. Sometimes people make the sort of uh, analogy that it's, it's like taking a nine volt battery and putting one pole in New York and then taking the other pole and putting it in London and being able to detect that, that potential, that difference in voltage across such a vast difference. So that gives you an idea of how sensitive these electroreceptors are. <clears throat> And okay, so here, here we come to like myth number two that I need to bust. A lot of times you will say, oh, these, this bio, these electroreceptors are picking up muscle contractions and heart rates and brain activity in their prey. And that's completely not true because those stimuli are actually too weak and they're insulated by the tissue. So there's no way that even with these sen sensitive cells that they could even pick them up. What it really is, the bioelectric fields are generated by osmoregulation. So that's the exchange of salts with the, or, or, I'm sorry, with the environment. So here with this cute little um, goldfish cracker, we have, you know, they, they live in salt water and they're eating their food and drinking. So they have to excrete a lot of salts and they do that at the gills and also at the mouth and also through their, at the renal uh, areas and, and the cloaca and stuff. So there's this constant sort of efflux of ions and that creates a DC current. So that's a direct constant sort of, mm, sort of current that's actually being generated. 
But what winds up happening is through the mechanism of ventilation. So you mentioned you've got this in and out, the sort of mechanics of it that modulates that DC signal into an AC or sort of alternating current. So it's sinusoidal in the way um, that is actually uh, um, expressed in real life. <clears throat> and the faster the breathing rate, the faster that sort of frequency is, is uh, of that AC signal. There's also a really interesting sort of secondary function. So you can use it to detect prey, but you can also use it to detect predators. So again, with our cute little elasmobranchs, um, some of them lay eggs in the environment and they develop externally for sometimes several months up to a couple of years. And what winds up happening is the cute little skate in this case, he or she will move its tail back and forth to flush water in and out to get rid of metabolic wastes and also as it sort of as it continues developing. <clears throat> but if you expose them to a weak bioelectric stimulus that sort of mimics what a, a predator might sound like, they stop and they, they freeze. And what, they, what happens when they freeze and they stop breathing, they actually reduce their bioelectric signature. So they become cryptic bioelectrically and also they uh, don't generate any water flow or any chemical signatures as well. So it's kind of like, imagine like a deer in the headlights. It sort of just freezes, waits for the predator to pass and then goes about its business. So you take away the stimulus and they start to flush their tail back and forth. Another really interesting um, use of electroreception is the detection of conspecifics. So in the mating season, the males are looking for females and they kind of want to have a date, so to speak. And if they have these females, uh, here in the case, it's a batoid or a stingray, I should say, <clears throat> they're buried, as you know, in the sand. So they're, they're visually cryptic. And the males can use their electroreceptors to detect buried females in order to mate with them. And also what's interesting too, if the female's not having it, she doesn't like the male and doesn't wanna go out on a date with them, she can actually take off and then use her electroreceptors to find other buried females in sort of a really shallow area to kind of get away from the males. So sort of sounds familiar, at least, at least I've heard about it in movies. I don't know, I've never really seen it in real life, but you know, I think it's actually sort of relatable. They can actually use this to detect conspecifics, <clears throat> which is actually really interesting. And sort of parenthetically, I would sort of add that my friend who, who did some of this work, Joseph Cisneros, actually found that that sensitivity, there's a plasticity to it. And it's it uh, the sensitivity of the males is a function of the circulating sex hormones. So when the mating season starts to come around, those androgens increase their sensitivity, uh, range the, the sensory tuning of the, of the male's electroreceptors to pick up on the bioelectric signature generated by the females, which is actually pretty cool, I think. <clears throat> Another really interesting function of electroreception is intraspecific communication. So skates, uh, they have this modified section of muscle here where it's actually the, this lost its contractile properties and it's become an electric organ and it's a weak electric organ. So there's this constant sort of dist well, not constant, but there's a certain discharge that they have in the presence of conspecifics. So when their friends are around, they can basically talk to each other. But the interesting thing is when you remove their friends, they don't have anybody to talk to and they go kind of quiet. We don't really know much about this, but it's a really interesting area. And I would really, I think it's a great um, sort of untapped area of research that, that I think would be really intriguing to figure out how these animals are actually using this to communicate. Now, lastly, and this starts to get into my personal research, at least during the PhD, one other function of electroreception, at least we, we believe it is, is the indirect detection of the geomagnetic field. So, Animals can use the Earth's magnetic field as a cue to orient and navigate from one spot to another. And that's a pretty intriguing uh, possibility. And we'll tell you about how this goes about in just a second. But let me give you a little background on migration in elasmobranchs. <clears throat> and I think it's really interesting because it's just an impressive feat. Here we have either some black tip sharks or some cow nose rays. And when I got into this, I was in Florida and, you know, there's this big migration of black tip, black tip sharks. It's actually going on right now. And they're in like about a meter 
of water, maybe two meters of water, and it's really shallow there in Florida. So we're talking like bathers and thousands of sharks right in the same water. And they're all going from Florida up north uh, as it gets warmer. <clears throat> so we could tag these sharks and then track them through acoustic arrays and stuff. And then they would go all the way up to Delaware. <clears throat> and then at some point, uh, they would come back to Florida. So basically kind of like snowbirds. Um, so what I always thought was really interesting is that's cool that they can do this sort of migration. But what I'm really interested in is how do these animals know where to go? And it's the same question that they brought up in Finding Dory, if you've seen that, and you remember, oh, the kids go to see the, the great stingray migration. And one of the kids sort of raises his fin and says, but how do the stingrays know where to go? And I'm like, you know, that's pretty perfect. That's basically what I'm asking. How does an animal know where it's at? How does it know where it wants to go? How does it know to turn left or right here, to stop, to, to go around or to keep going? Those are really interesting ideas or questions in my opinion. And so I kind of start to address some of this <clears throat> during my PhD or I tried to. But if we're gonna talk about navigation, there's a couple of things we need to sort of get out of the way first. It's not just quite as simple as going from point A to point B. When you do go from one spot to another, there's two things you actually need to do or things that you need to have. First is you need to have a sense of your location. And we call this a map sense. So think about it. You need to know where you are relative to where you want to go. So thinking of the PhD, if I was in Florida and I wanted to get to New York, I need to know that I'm basically at this point south and I need to go north generally to get up to New York. Well, okay, now I've got this map that tells me where I'm at and where I wanna go, but then which direction do I go? So I need a good sense of direction or some sort of compass to do to make sure that I'm headed in the right direction at all times. <clears throat> and you can actually get this from the geomagnetic field or at least there's cues from it. Now the compass is pretty easy for us to understand because that's just, there's two poles to a, a magnetic field and opposite poles attract. So, you know, your, your compass needle will tend to tell you which way is north. But how do you get a sense of location? That's the really um, sort of tricky part, but it actually makes a lot of sense. So here we have a little cartoon of the earth with our molten core that generates the uh, uh, magnetic field. And there's the field lines that emanate out into space and come back. <clears throat> and if you remember, or actually you might not know that the geom that a magnetic field is actually a vector. So anybody remember, um, see this is where if I could see everybody, I would stop and play teacher for a moment and just wait until somebody answered my question, but I can't do it. So I'm just gonna pretend that you guys can to remember this. So if you guys remember from, from science class, uh, vectors have two main properties, right? They have a magnitude and they have a direction. So with these arrows here, it, it indicates both. So the magnitude is the size of the arrow. The direction is obviously the direction of it relative to the surface of the earth. And what you can see here is that at the poles, it's strongest. So the magnitude or the intensity is strongest. At the equator, it's relatively weak. <clears throat> That's the strength of the field. And you see that the angle changes predictably with latitude as well. It's more orthogonal with respect to the surface here. So it can be like 90 degrees. And then it just gradually shifts to a parallel orientation at the equator and then back to 90. Well, actually it's 180 degrees opposite of this. So you've got a plus 90 and a negative 90. So if you can pick up on these cues, you can get a general sense of your latitude. So here's what we have of the geomagnetic field intensity across the surface of the earth. And if you can pick up on that cue, you can figure out if I have, if I can pick up on relatively strong cues, that tells me I'm in a polar location where those values are strongest. If it's relatively weak, that tells you you're more in an equatorial latitude. Likewise, you can do the same thing with the inclination angle. Remember, it's either plus or minus 90 degrees. That tells you you're either at one pole or the other. And if it's at zero degrees, you're at this magnetic equator here. So either one of those cues can give you a general sense of your latitude, but that's just latitude. What about longitude as well? Well, the really interesting thing is if you paid attention to both of these maps, if you can detect both cues and you see that they kind of overlap, but they don't perfectly overlap. And this lack of perfect overlap allows them to function in a bi-coordinate manner. So it really is 
an imperfect sort of sense of latitude and longitude if you can detect both intensity and inclination angle of uh, this magnetic field. And there are several animals out there that do this. Um, there are species of turtles and salmonids, so salmon that do this, but we don't really know, do elasmobranchs do this? And that's what I was setting out to, to, um, <clears throat> to test. And what I did is I used this cute little stingray called the yellow stingray, which we had in Florida. And as you can see in the, the little blue, um, this, this little distribution map here, we find them throughout the Caribbean. They're incredibly cute. They're about hand size when they're born. So they're live born, uh, they're pups. You find them in near shore rocky reefs and, and seagrass beds. And we would just go out and scoop them up with a dip net and bring them back to the lab. <clears throat> But what we wanted to do is see like, well, can these stingrays detect a change in magnetic field intensity? Well, again, remember how I said that magnetoreception, like electroreception, is well, it's kind of cryptic. We don't have a natural appreciation for what this sensory modality might look like, kind of like we don't understand infrared vision. Well, we kind of understand what infrared vision might look like, but that's kind of, uh, this is more of a stretch because it's completely different stimulus category. So how in the world uh, can I tell if these animals can detect magnetic field intensity? Because we don't really speak stingray very well. So one of the things that we did, or one of the, what I did, I should say, there's no we involved, but um, we had our tank here and I put an electromagnetic coil system around it. And this coil system can generate and control the ambient magnetic field, the intensity, the angle of it, all sorts of stuff. It's actually really cool. So what I did was, let's say this is a representation of the ambient field. It's got this downward component with a certain sort of size, a certain intensity. And if I change that intensity, in other words, make those, those uh, vectors bigger and stronger <clears throat> without changing the angle of it, how do I know that they've actually can detect this stimulus? Well, behavioral conditioning means you spatially, you overlap two stimuli in space and time. So it's like Pavlovian conditioning, uh, for lack of a better sort of description. So every time I change the intensity of the magnetic field, I would poke them at the base of the tail with a blunt stick. It wasn't a sharp stick, didn't need that, and they don't like it. And so at some point they would just shuttle across the tank to get away from me being annoying and irritating and poking them at the base of the tail. Well, you do this over and over and over again and overlapping these two stimuli, the magnetic change and then also the, the poking with the stick. The hope is that if they can detect that magnetic field intensity change, you should be able to withhold that stick and they should shuttle across the tank in and of themselves. If they've learned to make the association between the two stimuli and, but really what it says, if they can even detect the first stimulus to begin with. And so this is kind of what it looks like. So. Yes, this is actually a yellow stingray. We have black morphs as well. He was kind of my favorite because he was the odd person out. So he's just sitting there in the tank, minding his own business. You'll see that red flashing light at the top here. That means the stimulus is active and boom, he swims all the way across to avoid what he thinks, I'm gonna come and poke him with a stick. <clears throat> so that's a pretty good demonstration that he could pick up that stimulus, that change in magnetic intensity. Now, likewise, you can do the same thing with different animals. You can see, well, can they detect changes in magnetic field inclination angle? And that is basically the same uh, procedure, except it looks a little different. <clears throat> you just change the actual angle of it, leaving this, the strength of the field the same. You do the same sort of conditioning and you see if they will display it on their own without actually having to be prodded to do so. So here's a female and she's just sitting there minding her business. You see a different light is illuminated at the top here and she shuttles across without having to be prompted by poking of a stick. So you do this over and over and over again and <clears throat> to demonstrate learning, oops, hold on. Let's see, do, do, do. there we go. <laughs> I guess we're gonna watch it again. I'm trying to click forward. Okay, there we go. All right, <clears throat> so to demonstrate, what you wind up doing is you, you, you keep track of their progress and you develop or you generate these learning curves because you know we like graphs and stuff in science. And at some point they have, you know, they've gotten to a point where they demonstrate it well enough, they kind of pass the class, so to speak. <clears throat> and so this basically are some example learning curves of animals that can detect changes in field intensity 
and inclination angle. So that's actually really encouraging. But what I also wanted to do is see, can they distinguish between those two? So if I take someone who's been trained to detect intensity or respond to changes in intensity, how will they respond to changes in inclination angle? And without going into the gory details of the experiment, we can actually get them to demonstrate that they can distinguish between these two stimuli. And the reason why is that that tells us that they that being able to distinguish, detect, and distinguish between them means that they could most likely use these stimuli to get a very precise sense of their location. In other words, using that bi-coordinate map, not just a general Latin, latitudinal map. So that was actually really exciting. And this was the first time that we'd been able to demonstrate this in any shark, skate, ray, or anything like that. <clears throat> but remember, our friend Bugs Bunny, for those of us you actually have seen Bugs Bunny cartoons, and I know I'm kind of dating myself by saying that, he was always getting lost. He had his map, but he always quit. He always should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque, right? So he had a bad sense of direction. So a map is not good enough. You need to know which direction to head. <clears throat> so we were testing that out using to see if these animals could detect changes in magnetic field polarity. <clears throat> and in so doing, we could condition them in the same way. I'd put them in a T maze and here the, here's the ambient field here, here's south, here's north. And then I could actually change that field at the intersection. So now I could switch it such that north was to the left or south to the right, or I could do the other direction too. And if, if I would release the animal and he would make the correct choice, he would get a food reward. And if he made the incorrect choice, he would get mm, kind of a timeout, so to speak, and think about what he did wrong. And then we would have a talk and all this other sort of stuff. But the thing is, you don't want them to always cue into the taking the left turn. So you have to switch it back and forth, right? Because then otherwise they're just gonna keep taking a left turn. So you randomly switch it up. And when they choose correctly, you reinforce it. And then over the course of time, they demonstrate that yes, they are picking up and only using the change in polarity as the indicator of where to go to get the food award. So we were able to demonstrate here that yes, they do have a polarity compass, or at least we, we believe that they do. And a little video of it kind of looks like this. So here we're looking down the, the sort of the intersection of the T maze and I release the, or raise the gate and he's off to the races. And here he's experiencing the change in polarity and you have to take my word for it because we can't really see magnetic fields. He investigates the camera for a second, thinks about it, and then he goes off to the left and gets his food reward. <clears throat> so we can also generate interesting little learning curves from these guys too, so they can detect both magnetic south and north. But what I decided to do is like, what if I give them mixed messages? Like what if I change the sort of the, the, the reinforcement paradigm? How do they respond? <clears throat> so if I take a guy who's been trained to detect, use north as the cue, what, how will they respond if I give the, start reinforcing them with south? Will they kind of freak out? Will they eventually learn it? And lo and behold, they do learn it and they learn it a lot faster the second time around. So this gives us an idea of their behavioral flexibility, which is really important, especially in the face of rapid environmental change. So if something rapidly changes your environment, can you adapt to it? So this kind of at least gives us a metric to compare across species, like who might be more um, <clears throat> resistant, behaviorally resistant to sort of a rapid environmental change, which you know is you, you most likely due to something that we have done, uh, you know, through habitat loss or putting in anthropogenic noise or you know whatever, light pollution, you name it. So we figured out that the stingrays have a. a uh, a geomagnetic field gradient map, uh, the bicoordinate map, and a polarity compass. And why is this important? So in Florida, and actually a lot of other places, <clears throat> you, so let's just take it a hypothetical here. Here's our, our stingray, and he wants to get back home up to West Palm Beach. He was visiting somebody in Miami or something like that. It's pretty easy for him to just sort of swim north along the shoreline. Well, there's now there's renewable energy installations. And in New York, I know there's, there's quite a few going in there around Long Island. <clears throat> and these are great because it gives us uh, away from our dependency on fossil fuels, mitigates climate change, and that's really awesome. But one of the unintended side effects is that the high voltage cables that they lay along the, the ground or along the substrate to transfer that high voltage electricity 
back to shore where we can all have air conditioning and stuff like that, those generate electromagnetic fields around those cables. And it's thought that maybe that could be a barrier to benthically associated animals like the stingray or other fishes that are electrically and magnetically sensitive, maybe even lobsters. And so there's um, not just stingrays, but there's also uh, <clears throat> other species that are commercially important, ecologically important. So it's um, it can be a, a big issue. And we don't really know how this stuff affects or how these electromagnetic artifacts impact the, the marine life in, in these areas where the installations are going in. So I show you this video here. This is a baby bamboo shark. And he's kind of freaking out. And so the reason why he's freaking out is I'm giving him the exact same magnetic stimulus I was giving to my stingrays. And the stingrays, they didn't freak out like this. They would just sort of sit there and hunker down. But the baby bamboo shark, he doesn't like it. So just because you see something in one species doesn't necessarily mean that you can apply it to all species. We need to be smart and actually look at a lot of different species to see because not everybody kind of acts the same. <clears throat> So at the end of the PhD, I started to look for the postdoc and, you know, I've gone from doing really fun, cool stuff like field work on big blue sharks and thresher sharks and playing really cruel jokes on my parents um, here. <laughs> Hopefully, I don't know if you can see this, but this is actually, I just bent my finger and I put ketchup on the end of it. I took a picture and I sent it to my folks. I was out at sea doing this stuff and we had really bad cell reception. The picture went through and I thought they could see that this was a joke, you know, clearly it's ketchup, right? I mean, I can see it, you can see it. Well, they, they took it seriously and I felt like a bad kid, even as an adult, you know. <clears throat> so, you know, you kind of ask, is there something a little bit safer to do with your time? So I actually started to look into, I, I switched gears a little bit, but it's kind of related. I'm looking at what I call it the Ganges nano shark. actually, it's just zebrafish. And this is a model species used in biomedical research. And I work in an otolaryngology department, which is a fancy word for ear, nose, and throat uh, clinicians. And where we're, uh, <clears throat> the lab I'm in is really worried about human hearing loss. And the thing is, when we get damage to our sensory hair cells in our inner ear, that's it. Those cells do not repair. However, zebrafish and, and fishes and amphibians in their lateral line and their inner ear, they have the same types of sensory hair cells. They grow back in a matter of two to three days. So people are thinking this could be a way to mitigate human hearing loss. <clears throat> so this lateral line system is very similar to the electroreceptor system. It's peripherally distributed along the side of the body and it's distributed into these canal and superficial sort of neuromasts. The neuromasts are the organs that actually detect water flow and they are composed of sensory hair cells, just like the ones in your inner ear, but they're just located outside the body. Within the canal neuromass, they again are obviously located within a canal and the superficial ones are on the surface. So if you get a water flow stimulus going here from left or right, they detect two different kinds of parameters of that water flow. The canal detects a change in pressure. So you get an area of high pressure and then low pressure here. So they pick up, if you go back to sort of first principles in physics, this is really acceleration. So they detect the acceleration of water flow Whereas those on the super uh, the superficial neuromass, they detect velocity. So it's just that change in, in, uh, in water displacement over time. <clears throat> and this is what we're gonna look at because I'm gonna shift to larval zebrafish and all of their start off as superficial. And then later some of them grow into the canal. Anatomically, this is very similar to, uh, and, and lateral branks have lateral lines too. But we're talking about teleos here, so it's very similar. We have the anterior and posterior lateral line nerve. Again, we have, here's our superficial and canal neuromasts in different colors. And it goes into a similar area of the brain. Remember, here we're looking at the medial octavolateral nucleus. There is no dorsal octavolateral nucleus because those uh, zebrafish don't have electroreceptors. And here's our eighth cranial nerve. So this is our inner ear <clears throat> and the vestibular inputs as well. Looking at the sensory cells real quick. So remember, here's your electroreceptor, and this is how it works. There's the calcium influx due to the electrical sort of change in the, uh, the lumen here. But if we look at the lateral line hair cell, it's very similar. And you even have, here's this kind of cilium, which we actually have here on the electroreceptor, but you also have these other little hairs here. And what winds up happening, <clears throat> happening is 
these calcium channels get open when you physically displace that hair. Either it either gets inhibited or excited, depending upon which direction you, you deflect it. <clears throat> and that can either open or sort of close off these calcium channels. You get calcium input here, and then a neurotransmitter gets released to the afferent. Again, also I want to point out that there's efferent modulation. So this time, the, the brain can actually modulate the sensitivity or the sort of the range of these uh, hair cells, especially if there's uh, if they're exposed to a particularly strong stimulus, this can actually sort of modulate and sort of tone it down. And let's see, let's look. Okay, so we're looking at larval zebrafish. So now I've gone from big sharks to stingrays to now larvae, which are five millimeters long and you can barely see them because they're transparent and they have two little black eyes and that's about it. Um, so this is what they look like. Um, and here's the uh, neuromasts here in pink. And if you do a fancy confocal uh, bit of microscopy here, so immunohistochemistry, this is what it actually looks like in real life. So here's the nerve, <clears throat> the kind of cilium. So these are the hairs that actually detect the, uh, the dis displacement of the water flow. Actually, it's, well, they're surrounded by a cupula, which acts like a sail, so to speak, to catch the water. Here's the cells themselves. These are the primary afferents, the neurites here, these green lines here, and then the yellow are the actual synapses. So we can actually label the synapses. So this is all immunohistochemistry. And what's really cool too about working with larval uh, zebrafish being transparent and a model organism, they have a lot of genetic modification systems. Oh, so here's the water flow. It activates the, uh, deflects the kind of cilium and you can actually activate. So you can actually see the activity of the cells in the live intact animal. So this is actual neuromast and this is calcium. These flashes are activation. So you're actually getting calcium flowing into the cell itself. So as you stimulate it, you can actually see this. So this is actually a really cool advantage and a kind of a fun tool that you can use with small uh, model organisms like this. It's kind of tough to do this on a shark because they don't really like to be in a lab under a microscope. <clears throat> So let's talk about the lateral line a little bit. What are some of the behaviors that it mediates? Well, there's quite a few. Um, it mediates foraging, communication between conspecifics, hydrodynamic imaging, <clears throat> predator avoidance. Uh, it mediates the distance between individuals within schools and also rheotaxis. So that's what I'm gonna talk about less, uh, next is rheotaxis, which is the orientation with respect to flowing water. And there's two different kinds of rheotaxis you can orient either into the flow, so that's called positive rheotaxis, or away from the source of the flow, that's negative. But interestingly, rheotaxis is not just mediated by the lateral line, or at least there's some debate about whether or not the lateral line actually plays much of a role, and that's what we're gonna get into here in a minute. But there's a lot of other sensory systems, like the visual system, the tactile and the vestibular, that contribute to this ability of animals to orient into flowing water. So what I'm interested in is does noise impact rheotaxis in zebrafish? Because we've been able to show that noise, <clears throat> 60 hertz noise, will actually damage those hair cells of the lateral line. They eventually do grow back, but I wanted to see does it impact their natural behaviors? How does it impact their behaviors? So if you expose these animals to noise for a couple of hours, can they actually swim into the water flow or not? <clears throat> But in order to do this, we had to develop an assay. So that's what I'm gonna talk about for just a minute here. We had to actually develop some sort of positive control, so to speak. So here is an example of what it would look like if you ablate the lateral line. So in other words, you can get rid of it through chemical means. <clears throat> so here's a control fish with an intact lateral line. So this is at the supraorbital, so above the eye. <clears throat> and here it's actually been ablated with, by bathing it with copper sulfate or neomycin, and neomycin is just an antibiotic, and um, it's actually uh, in a whole class of antibiotics that we actually use as well. So this can actually, these antibiotics can damage your hearing if they get exposed, like if you were to actually get some in your inner ear in the endolymph or something like that. So that's part of one of the things with, with um, <clears throat> hearing loss. Some of it can come from therapeutic agents, so they're trying to see if there are there ways to sort of mitigate that. So I would ablate these lateral line <clears throat> neuromasts in fish and then put them into an apparatus to see if they could swim. So I designed kind of like a little racetrack for lack of a, a term, better term. It's, it's like a, 
It's a flume, basically it's based on a large flume, but it's a micro flume about this size, eight or nine inches across. And it's a 3D print. So this is just transparent plastic. And we designed this and there's a little pump in here that actually comes from, um, it's from an RC yacht of all things. I didn't know they had such things, but yes, this is from an RC yacht. <laughs> And uh, it actually generates the water flow. So we could control that through, you know, series of switches and rheostats and stuff. And then we would isolate the fish in this little arena. So this kind of like a treadmill. Think about it this way. They can only go so far. The water starts to flow and they either have to swim or they get blown against the back grate here. <clears throat> and we filmed this under infrared light because we wanted to take away visual cues. So we actually do this in the dark. So we're at least trying to hone in on what the lateral line is actually doing in these animals. And this is kind of an overall view. So we have the camera, the flume, and we're filming it in a high speed, so sometimes really high speed. It all goes to a computer and we save it on, on hard drives and stuff like that. So this is actually where we're starting to talk about the machine learning uh, thing that I had mentioned at the very beginning. So this is a new, uh, and actually a, it's becoming kind of a big deal, at least in neuroscience, we would take these videos that we would film of the animals, pre-process them, you know, crop them down, sample them stuff. And then we would extract some frames. So video is just nothing but a sequence of frames playing over and over. We would take out some frames, like say 20 from a subset of say 10 videos. <clears throat> and we would take those videos and we would label these body parts here. So I chose the left and the right eye, the swim bladder here and four points along the tail. And what we do after labeling these body parts on all of those frames from all of those from that subset of videos, we create a model based on that data. And we put it into the model. So this is called Deep Lab Cut, which is an open source software developed by some former postdocs at Harvard. And it's actually really, really cool because you can you go through like 100,000, maybe up to a million iterations. You generate this model and then you can take hundreds of videos that you've not labeled and s run them through the model. And then it will analyze all that stuff and give you the X, Y coordinates of those body parts over time. So you don't have to actually go through and manually track all that yourself. The machine does it for you because you've created it. It's learned how to analyze these body parts and you can track those body parts, <clears throat> you know, in space and time, which is actually really cool. But what we did then what I was interested in is I took that original data. So these are all X, Y coordinates of every body part throughout the video. We would take that data and then we would put it into another software to actually annotate the behaviors. So we would pre-process that stuff, take that deep lab cut data, so the CSV files and all those body parts, put it into a new software to generate a new model that is more specific towards behaviors that we're interested in. So again, we would sort of extract these frames and we would label the behaviors. So we would say, okay, from frames four to 19, this is Rio taxes, this is Rio taxes, these other frames are not. Use that to generate a model. So here's the specific things about Rio taxes. <clears throat> this is actually what a deep lab cut um, labeled video looks like. So here you see your, your little larval zebrafish and they tend to burst and glide. So it's not a constant swimming. There's no water flowing right now. So we would do this this sort of background to get a baseline idea of their activity. So now we're tracking the animal. And then now we get a water flow. And you can see he's actually drifting downwards and he's swimming into it. Swim, 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 little guy, swim. I always want to root for him every time they do it. So this is starting to actually, this is what Rio Taxis is right here. So we have a couple of criteria. Okay, so the water has to be flowing. They have to be oriented towards zero degrees, which is 12 o'clock here, that's top. But they also have to be at like 45 degrees. So they, we, they have some, some leeway. So zero degrees plus or minus 45. <clears throat> and sometimes they get drift and sometimes they get blown against. So we don't wanna count that. So sometimes we also look at, let's see, are they moving their tail? And are they actually, is there any forward translation? Are they moving forward? So these are the criteria that we'd use to define real taxes and we would, create a new model from that. So again, this is a different model, but the same principle. And then at some point, <clears throat> you know, the machines take over and, you know, who knows, maybe the earth is a better place. I don't know. But these are, this is actually saving us a lot of time. So we could go through and actually, so here are three example videos. I've got a control, a copper and a neo, and I'm going to try and play them all. And I'm going to see 
if you can tell me the difference between all three of them. So this has come through a process called Simba and it's labeling Rio Texas here. So hopefully it's not dropping too many frames. So you'll see when it's actually classifying Rio Texas. So this would be another moment where I would ask questions of the audience. And this should be almost done here. So <clears throat> one of these kids is not like the other. One of them is the control. <clears throat> and I will tell you, it is actually, oops, let's see. It's, it's the middle one. So the interesting thing is, so here's, here's the take home message. You can ablate the lateral line. These, are, these have no lateral line in them, but they can still perform the behavior. So that's actually really interesting. But if you could actually see, I, th I think if the video quality if the transmission here on Zoom is good enough, you could see that this copper sulfate, this guy is struggling right here. He's really struggling. He can still do it, but he's struggling. The neomycin, they can do it, but they kind of struggle too. So can we quantify those differences in behavior? That's what gets really kind of interesting now. So we actually can quantify it. So we take all that data and kind of, you know, analyze all the stats and stuff. And we see that, yes, the controls here in gray do spend a lot more time, proportion of the time performing Rio Texas instead of the, the treatments. We also see that if you look at the overall angular data here throughout the course of the experiment, so here's our controls. They have uh, an intact lateral line. The, the mean, uh, this is sort of the average. Uh, so each one of these is an individual fish. This is his or her. Um, mean body angle. And you see that they're kind of randomly distributed throughout that no stimulus period. So they're, that, that's actually good. So they're not having natural orientation. But when you apply the stimulus, <clears throat> you see that they all go towards zero or 12 o'clock here. And they're all kind of tightly clustered around that. There's a few stragglers over here, which is pretty normal. And then throughout the course of the experiment, they, they maintain that sort of uh, that distribution, that tight distribution around zero degrees. When you look at the copper sulfate fish, again, everybody's kind of randomly distributed with no stimulus. They can orient into it, but it's not quite as well. This vector here is not quite as long. So that means they're not quite as, there's not their fidelity towards that angle is, is a little less because their distribution is a little bit broader here. <clears throat> and you see the same thing over the course of time. They get a little bit better throughout the course of the experiment, but initially they really struggle. <clears throat> and with the neomycin fish, we see a similar pattern, but it's not quite as bad or as extreme as in the copper sulfate. So everybody can still perform the behavior like you saw in those original videos, but there are some differences. And if we look at them all together, it's a little easier to see the differences that this actually is a big difference because we've got such big sample sizes and there actually are statistically significant. So we're thinking, yeah, there's a real effect here. So there's a real contribution of the lateral line to the behavior, but what is it? <clears throat> So let's look at a little bit more data here. So this is actually the spatial distribution. So this is the arena here in the X and Y. Remember the water flow would be going from top to bottom. Everybody under no stimulus has kind of this dispersed orientation or dispersed sort of X, Y spatial occupation, regardless of where they're at. There's no real clustering. I mean, there is kind of against the edges, which is not unusual for animals. They tend to explore their boundaries. Uh, when you put them in a new environment, it's called Figma taxis. <clears throat> but as you apply, whoops, sorry. If we take a, um, it becomes really obvious if you sort of sandwich all these together and look at them sort of down the axis. So you scrunch all the data, you flip it on its edge and we're looking down the X axis here and you look from left to right that all of these, so these are the controls and, and the two treatments, they have a similar distribution. They, they tend to like the edges they avoid the middle, but there's no real differences in these curves. They're all kind of have the same sort of track. And if you look at the Y axis too, so we're looking front to back, they still are kind of widely distributed. There are some differences in the peaks, but it's not huge. <clears throat> it's not really that significant. The interesting thing is when you look at the stimulus. So this is what you start to see. The controls occupy the front half of the arena, whereas the treatments occupy the back half more often. So even though everybody can still perform the behavior, the controls can be right up in the source. So they're at where the, the source is strongest and the most laminar flow. Whereas the treatments, 
they tend to get blown back and they tend to struggle a bit more. So they're, they're kind of back here sort of huffing and puffing, trying to get it, uh, trying to actually get away from being blown against the, uh, the back grate here. <clears throat> Again, if we sort of stack those and look down one axis, we see that within the X axis, the curves are very similar to each other. Although now everybody's kind of, they like to hang out on the right side a little bit more. And I have some ideas about why that might be. Um, but if you look, this is where it gets really interesting. If you look at the Y axis, so we're looking front to back here. At the front, which is on the left, you see that the controls occupy that space more than say the two treatments, which are in the back space. So that reinforces what we saw in those heat maps earlier, just a second ago. There's a couple of other little interesting things too, and I'll just briefly go over them real quick. So we looked at the actual movement of the animals over the course of time, and we can see that, oops, if we looked at the controls, so I'm just really trying to illustrate here that there's a difference among these three colored curves. We see that the controls, if I can go backwards, this is kind of like the average position, their change in relative position over the course of the, the stimulus experiment. We see that the neomycin, they tend to move around a little bit more, but they have the same sort of overall sort of placement on the graph. But the copper sulfate, those peaks are much, much bigger. There's a lot more variance in their behavior. <clears throat> and if we look at velocity, so these are just time derivatives of, of positional data. We're looking at here's the, the relative velocity around the controls. They tend to hover around zero. Everybody does because it's remember it's relative. The neomycin are pretty similar, but a little bit more variance. But those coppers, whoa, they're kind of way all over the place. And this gets really obvious when you look at the acceleration of the animals in time. Those copper sulfate ones are way out <clears throat> in left field, so to speak, compared to the others. So there's something really interesting going on. And there's still a lot of data that we're still kind of parsing. But it begs the question, what is the lateral line function and what does it actually do in this behavior? So interestingly enough, we think that there's this supports part of the, the, the question that, yeah, we, we think that the lateral line does mediate rheotaxis, but it does, it's not required to do rheotaxis because the treatment animals could do it. Theirs was ablated. But what it does is it allows animals to station hold. So remember that acceleration data for the controls, they were, and even all the positional data, they kind of just hovered. So they could sort of maintain their position in water flow a lot easier than those without the lateral line. So they're not getting quite the, the rapid, uh, the sensory feedback of the changes in their, of the water flow. <clears throat> and they're not able to make their corrections um, quickly. So this means that they're, um, that the, the intact lateral line, they have smoother transitions between behavioral states, they have lower acceleration values. And if we think about this back to originally those behaviors that the lateral line mediates, this makes a big deal when it comes to foraging, because if you're off, like if your timing is off just a little bit, or your, your sort of, your predatory strike is off by a little bit, you're gonna miss getting your prey. Same thing with predator avoidance. If you're just a little bit late responding to that predator, or you're just a little bit off in your trajectory, that can mean the difference between life or death. And so that affects the fitness of the individuals. What we're doing now, right, as we speak, is looking at how noise impacts Rio Texas. I know I kind of promised I was doing that. And really what I can tell you is that it does impact it. We haven't analyzed all the data, so I haven't really presented it here. But what we're looking at is how does that noise impact it? What does, how can we quantify those behavioral differences? And then what is the, what physiological mechanisms are coming back online as the behavior gets recovered throughout this 48 to 72 hour period post ablation? <clears throat> so that's where we're kind of going next. And that's the, the stuff I'm working on right now. And with that, I think I've talked long enough and I really appreciate all your attention. This would never be possible without a lot of people and a lot of help and, um, I'm willing to take questions uh, for those of you who are still hanging out and want to ask. So thank you very much. Hey, that was great. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. And uh, I don't want to hog things. I actually have a few questions, actually many. But, um, but let me, I guess the, the two that are in the front of my mind right now, and I have a, a whole long, 
first is, I should probably do it one at a time, but I'm going to say both in case I forget. The first is that with regards to uh, the lateral line and the strength of the lateral line, it's used for navigation. How similar is that between, say, skates and sharks and fish? I mean, are they all, it's, is it more well-developed in the elasmobranchs than it is in, say, fish? Is that, is that the case? You know, <clears throat> I don't know if I'd say it's more well-developed. I would say, um, interestingly enough, in Telios, there are several, well, I just think that it's actually, I would say probably in Telios, it might be a little more derived. Um, and the only reason I say that is, um, is uh, thinking about Mexican blind cave fish, they actually spatially navigate because they're blind and they actually use that as navigation. So, <clears throat> but actually quantifying like how more developed or derived it is, that's a little bit different. Not, there's not been a lot of work on the lateral line in shark skates and rays. Um, there's a little bit, um, but I don't know. And people tend to ablate that, you know, chemically if they want to sort of do a, a temporary sort of sensory deprivation. But to my knowledge, there's not been much work, certainly not like this um, as to, to how, and also quantifying it in this manner. So that's a really good question. Um, I'd say that it's, a, it's an area that's wide open and, and, you know, so I'm sure there's like a master's student or a PhD who could look at it. Okay, all right. Well, I can't even get to my second question because there's a few in here. So I, I got uh, okay. two I'll hold. Uh, Joe Warren, who's on our faculty, he, and he does high, uh, does acoustics. Mm -hmm. He is asking: Is the sixty hertz noise experiment examining what loudness is needed to get a response, and/or why was the specific frequency chosen? That's a really good question. So, actually, the schematic I gave you just a second ago here is a little bit deceptive. It's really, we're not doing, it's not actually an acoustic, it's, it's actually more physical displacement. So we get an industrial shaker and it's used for sort of detecting, uh, determining like the stress tolerances and, and like mechanical like factory parts and stuff like that. And so it's, it's basically like a giant piston. It's about this size and it's a piston that goes up and down. So we put the little larvae in like a 96 well plate and we literally shake the living crap out of them for like two hours. So they just shake at 60 Hertz over and over for like two hours. And that mechanically ablates the lateral line. And the reason that that, that was chosen is because it actually, the animals would survive. So if we did really low, they would tend to actually turn into like mush. And at certain higher frequencies, they actually wouldn't, they, it actually wouldn't do much damage at all. So it was kind of, it kind of worked basically with what we had. And so this is the sort of, at least in the biomedical sort of realm, they just kind of, this is what people have decided on. And so that's what we started with. Yeah, and Joe followed up just saying, oh, so it's a particle motion detection yes. response experience. Yes, yes, it's not acoustic, it's particle motion, yes. All right. So we have a question from Neil Gunther who's asking, does Long Island, where we are, <laughs> ever get vagrant black tip sharks to your knowledge? Um, I want to say yes. Um, I would have to check with my old PI. Uh, so Steve Kajura is my old PI down at FAU. And I think they've been working on, actually my friend Beth is finishing up her PhD working on all this stuff. So she was the one who started, we started putting all the transmitters on the sharks. And I want to say that they might get up there like in a blue moon. When, we, when I showed that original picture, that was like Delaware Bay, I believe, where that one track was that I showed. And at the time, when I stole that picture from her a few years ago, that was the farthest north that we'd seen them go. But I wouldn't be surprised if you get the, the sort of the, the sort of the stray that gets up there, especially, you know, if you get like a lot of warm water going up there, uh, you know, at a particular, you know, for sort of oceanic conditions. Yeah, we tend to get... Uh... Uh, Gulf Stream eddies spinning up with warm water late summer. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, it's, yeah. I think the thing is, is nobody's really looked at it until the last few years. And I think also what they're seeing too is with, at least they're starting to think that with climate change and the, the shifting of the sea surface temperatures, there are years when it's a little bit warmer or colder and that changes the distribution. So when things get a little bit too warm in Florida, you see that the, the sharks don't actually come quite so far south. They tend to stay a little more northward. So 
as the ocean temperatures rise, they think that they're going to start to shift a little more north of the, of the east coast there. Yeah, a lot of things are doing there. Yeah, right. Um, okay, uh, Connor is asking, how exactly does neomycin damage the lateral line? That's a really good question. We think that it is, We that's one of the things that we've actually been looking at in the lab. And we think it goes through the MET channel. So there's um, the mechanical um, sort of <clears throat> as, uh, there's the, basically when you when you get this mechanical deformation of the the kind of cilia, it kind of opens this basically causes a channel to open, and that allows the calcium to to sort of flow in. And we think that there's damage to the MET channel, although um, we're not quite totally sure. But we think that that's kind of what's going on is that there's some sort of physical damage or chemical damage, I should say, that's inhibiting the sort of the the, the transduction or the the sort of detection of the stimulus. Right. And then basically, so that's that, but it also, I think what winds up happening is it actually, to actually kill the cells, there's also, that leads to a sort of a cascade sort of effect of down these molecular pathways, which is kind of a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but um, that's part of sort of the thing. So there's, it's basically things are starting to come in that normally wouldn't come in and then the cells start to die. That's kind of it in the, in the short term or the, yeah, brief. All right. We had, uh, our old friend Toby Curtis, alumni of this. Ah, Toby. Campus. <laughs> hey, Toby. He, he chimed in to say that black tips uh, often reach Western Long Island Sound in in August and September, which is when we get at our warmest. So there you go. There you go. I mean, it makes perfect sense. It makes yeah. perfect sense. I just wonder how far they're actually going. Like they could go even further. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Brad Peterson, our faculty here, Benthic ecologist is asking how different is the mechanical sensory mechanisms in lobsters with regards to the lateral line? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, but it'd be really interesting to find out. Um, I know they can detect magnetic stimuli, but that's not what you asked. <laughs> 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 because that's actually really cool. I know that some folks down in, in um, that's a really interesting question. I don't know because the lateral line itself is actually only present in basal vertebrates. So we're talking fishes and amphibians for the most part. And um, as far as inverts, that's a really good question. I don't really know. I don't really know. I mean, they have to be able to detect it, but what the organs are and what their sort of sort of peripheral displacement or peripheral sort of organization, what the sensory array is, that's a good question. I don't know. Huh. All right. Well, sounds oh, like sorry, another sorry. good research topic. We can. Yeah, I was going to say another good research. Get one of those master students on that. Yeah, yeah. All right. So I'm I'm going to ask my second question, and that is, you know, wind energy is becoming a really hot topic around here, and there's a lot of planned wind farms. Um, and I will say there is, you know, the there's already concern about the landing of the electrical lines and when yeah. they'll come on land. The concerns mainly, honestly, to date, have really focused around here on, um, you know, disruption of the, uh, where they're going to land. Yeah. Um, so like a physical. Like, uh, yeah, but now you've raised a whole second topic here. So I'm just, I guess, I'm wondering how is, and this is good for a couple of the people uh, who are listening as well. They probably are thinking about writing grants about this. But <laughs> how is there? Is there a good case to be made based on data out there that the these uh, uh, electrical cables will or will not have uh, some sort of disruptive effect? Um, you know, um, so that's a huge area that's wide open. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of research that needs to be done on that. And so uh, that's actually the, that's the direction I want to go with a lot of my stuff, because I think it's, you know, I kind of like, it's the confluence of a lot of interest for me. Um, and I really would love to figure out what's going on. There was a recent study that uh, Zoe Hutchinson did, and I think came out a year or two ago, and they did some stuff on lobsters and uh, little skates and showed that there are some effects. It's actually a bit of an attraction because when the stimulus gets really weak, um, as you get away from those cables, it can actually start to be a little more attractive, kind of like those weak bioelectric fields. And the animals might kind of like, ooh, is there food around here? And they might sort of spend time foraging in an area where there's nothing to forage for. 
So you could imagine that if that was continual, you might get this sort of reduction in fitness because you're wasting your time and energy in a fruitless endeavor. Conversely though, we don't really know. So the, the, the power transmission through those cables, it fluctuates with season, with day, with ever, you know, with, with the needs of the grid, you know, with if everybody's running their air conditioner. So that means that there could be a much stronger, I'd like a magnetic artifact generated around the cable at times of peak usage. So then those maybe weaker stimuli might become stronger. And then that could be somewhat of a barrier that's inhibitory to animals. Um, kind of like what I showed. That's why I showed that little anecdotal video of the little baby uh, bar, uh, bar head, bamboo shark that it was kind of freaking out. Those were really weak stimuli that I was giving the stingrays and they didn't bat an eye, so to speak, at it. They just kind of sat there and hunkered down. They would flutter their, their little uh, fins, but that was it. They didn't freak out and turn around. That's how I was able to condition them. But I could, there's no way I could have done that with the, the, the baby bamboo shark because they just naturally freak out. So it depends on the species you're asking. It depends on the ontogenetic stage. So the age of development, um, there's a whole host of questions that need to be answered and we just don't know. Not much research has been done and the stuff that has been done is very preliminary. And so, you know, that's something I would love to address. And, and I think that that's, um, you know, a very important area that, that, you know, we need to understand, quite frankly, it'd be better to know before we, you know, figure out or before we install all this stuff so that maybe we can mitigate it now in the design mm -hmm. instead of trying to put a patch on it later. That's at least yeah. my opinion. So. Sounds like somebody's got to figure it out. That's yeah, I know, right? Another good, another good project. So. I know, right? <laughs> that's, our, that's our third, who, who knew? <laughs> all right, well, um, I think we've uh, hit the hour and 15 minute mark here, which is- yeah. Well, thanks everybody for your time. I yeah, yeah, well, thank thank you, Kyle, so much. That was really interesting. I think uh, I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody else did as well. And oh, thank uh, you. Thank you, thank you very much. If anybody has any additional questions later, you can reach me at, at uh, this email address here. I think it's still up on the screen. So um, yeah, find me, I'd love to chat about it. So thanks a lot for your time. and. Appreciate you letting me come on and sort of share what I do with you guys. Well, we appreciate it as well, Kyle. So, Thank you. Uh, yeah, stay in touch and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll hear from you again soon, I hope. All right, sounds good. Look forward to it. Have a okay. good day. Thank you everybody for attending and uh, we'll see you on April Fool's Day. <laughs> All right, good night everyone. Thank you.